Okay, welcome to the webinar, those of you who have joined already. Um, just to let you know that we've got um, Gary with us um, this evening as well, who's just keeping an eye on the IT things. And um, we've also got Alan with us as well, just in case there's any more um, questions kind of related more to course content and things like that. We've had some questions um, submitted um, already, so while some of you are kind of gathering your thoughts on questions, um, I'll start with some of the questions that have already been submitted. Um, one that comes up quite a lot when we do these webinars, which is one here, which is, what are your th thoughts on immediate dentine sealing with bond and flowable composite when doing posterior restorations? both direct and indirect. Um, really, there's a, there's a number of times when you might want to seal restorations, and certainly I've done it um, a couple of times over the last uh, week or so. So for instance, I did a canine to canine bridge on a perio patient uh, last week, and the canines were sound, but the incisors needed extracting. She wasn't the best candidate for implant placement. So after prepping the canine teeth, basically I etch them, wash them, dry them, and then put bond on at that point then. It becomes more important to dentine seal the sound of the tooth is. So for heavily restored teeth, anterior or posterior, I wouldn't recommend dentine sealing because these heavily restored teeth, the pulp will have receded quite a lot. In addition to the pulp receding quite a lot, what will also have happened is a lot of secondary dentine as well. So I generally limit it mainly to anteriors or posteriors that I'm basically prepping, but they're quite sound. Um, the technique that I would generally use is I would wash, dry, etch the tooth, etch it for about 40 seconds, thoroughly wash it, lightly dry it, and then just put a... Other thing you can do as well is it's fine to use a self-etch primer as well. Um, and that's all you need to do. And you can basically prep it and put the bond on, then do your impression. So basically that keeps things um, just nice and simple for everybody. Somebody was asking what's the evidence? Um, very limited evidence. Um, the technique is kind of the Pashley technique described by Pashley. I use it a lot for these teeth though that are sound. My experience with it is that I get um, virtually no post-op sensitivity after. So when I use this technique, um, I get no, no sensitivity after. So it does seem to work in the immediate short term. What it does is it stops bacterial ingression and it also stops fluid movement in the tubules as well. So all of that lowers sensitivity and would hopefully lower your risk of pulp death. Is there any evidence? No, but it's such a simple technique to do that I quite like to do it most of the time, to be honest, if they're a sound or a relatively sound tooth. So I hope that helps. Could you give some advice on immediate stabilization of cracked teeth? And what criteria would you use to decide which are unrestorable? I think with um, immediate stabilization of cracked teeth, um, it's tricky. One of the ways that I tend to like to do it is literally, if, you, if you're thinking that the tooth is going to have to have an indirect restoration, take the tooth down by a couple of millimetres and then simply run a composite over the top. So etch the tooth, run over it with something like the Denta Prep or the Bioclear Blaster, and then do basically a heated composite over the whole occlusal surface, which will basically bond um, the tooth together and it should protect it. Now, in terms of unrestorable, refer to, um, there's a couple of articles in your reading lists. One of them, which is 
crucial article. It's the Samet and Djokovic article. That is one of the first articles or one of the best on trying to classify teeth as A, B, C, D, X. Now, if it's D or X, particularly X, it's not restorable. So you have evidence-based criteria for that. So simply apply, the, apply those criteria. Is it an X tooth in which it needs to come out? If you have problem, find it the Summit and Djokovic article. It is in your packs, and there's a summary as well. Um, let us know, and we'll make sure that's made available um, to you. The next question was, um, is Emacs Press acceptable for single unit crowns? And what about Press Plus Ceram? Yep, Emacs is perfectly acceptable for um, posterior use. There's moderate evidence on its success now. Main things you have to think about with Emacs posteriorly is it has to be at least 1.5 millimeters thick occlusally up to two millimeters occlusally. And the only Emacs that I've had break um, on posterior teeth has been in parafunction patients. So if they parafunction, then just be a little bit careful, perhaps avoid Emacs, go for traditional metal ceramic if they want something aesthetic, or quite acceptable to go for mill only zirconia with no felspathic on. And don't forget if it's NHS or something like that, then just non-precious alloys are absolutely fine as well. So non-precious alloys, gold, all of those are absolutely fine as well. Okay. Next question was, when designing a cantilever bridge in the premolar region, um, what's more favorable, a distal or mesial cantilever? Um, Again, cantilevers, moderate evidence for this, but um, all the consensus is go always for a mesial cantilever. Mesial cantilevers always seem to fare better than distal cantilevers. Make sure with resin retained bridge work as well that you have as much tooth to bond to as possible. So you can use electrosurge to expose more tooth. Follow your retainers around quite a lot as well. And also make sure, particularly on the, not on the retainer, but on the pontic, that you get this protected occlusion. That's absolutely um, essential to try and um, ensure the success of that. So have we got another question on there? We had another one. Oh, yeah, coming back to Emacs, somebody was about asking about Press Plus Ceram. Um, off the top of my head, I would have to check that. Um, I would be cautious about Press, Press Plus Ceram because all my experiences with Emacs, all of the studies and all of the data are on Emacs as well. And so it's very much that pretty much virtually all of the labs are using Emacs. Don't forget Emacs comes in Press and it comes in CAD CAM as well. The Press is a little bit stronger than the CAD. However, you'll find virtually all of the labs now moving over to CAD Emacs. So it's, I would tend to step to Press Emacs or CAD Emacs should be fine. What is the best material to remove panavia from a debonded bridge abutment? Um, there's no easy way to do it, unfortunately. The trouble with the panavia is it's um, chemically active. It has chemically active phosphates in it. So it actually chemically bonds to your metal. So there is no easy way to remove it. Um, scalar works well. The gross reduction just do with a fine grit diamond. And then what I use is either something like the Bioclear Blaster or something like the uh, Denta Prep unit, which is the fine aluminium oxide or trioxide um, grit blasting, just to remove the remainder of it. But a scaler is quite a good way to get rid of it, although it's a little bit time consuming. Um, Essentially, that there's no easy way. There is there is no easy way um, to do it. Unfortunately, it's just one of those things. Okay. This is anchor. 
Okay. Oh yeah, when is BioClear 3 and 4 available? Um, off the top of my head, um, don't know, but we can check that um, very shortly for you. Um, funnily enough, I'm actually out at the BioClear Centre in um, Tacoma next week doing some advanced stuff. Um, however, I do know that the level um, three is ready to go. We are actually doing some of that for our level two students um, in there because they come for the, the level two students who are residential will have a day of it. And the level two students who are online and come for four days practical, they're going to be having it as well. So it's all in the pipeline. So what we'll do is I'll have to get back to you on that with those dates. Uh, but certainly that's in the pipeline. That's all ready to go. That's all ready to go. Next question was going back to metal ceramic. Any indications for semi-precious or non-precious? Um, yeah, this is a good question, actually, because basically for metal ceramic, um, go non-precious. Going semi-precious, um, it can make it a little bit easier for the lab to cast it. From a dental point of view, it puts the cost up, but you get no discernible benefit from it. What you need to think about then is going precious. So you can go metal ceramic, but with a high gold alloy. Now that will have a yellow color. So that's going to be something like about 80% gold if it's cast or something like CapTech, which is a foil. Now, if you get that kind of yellow color of the gold, there is an aesthetic advantage. And that ties in with one of the other questions about bridges that somebody was asking, well, what do you do for a bridge at the front of the mouth? Um, first thing to do, avoid Emacs bridges. The data is, is very variable and some of it very depressing on Emacs bridges and they always break at the retainer. So don't do e Emacs bridges if you can help it. Metal ceramic is great for bridges, but it's moderately aesthetic and it's your most destructive. How can we get that bridge looking better? Go gold ceramic. For a, so for a short span bridge, if you go high gold, 80% or above, but stipulate to the lab that you want it to have a gold color not being palmed off with white gold where the gold contents lower and it just looks like non-precious so go gold the beauty of the gold is that your preparation can be just a little bit more minimal than metal ceramic because you don't need an opaque to cover the metal they can go straight onto the gold which has this warm dentine like color so i do still do anterior bridges in gold ceramic because it's a good balance between a minimal prep and it's also aesthetic. One problem with the gold, um, it's not cheap. So if you're going to go gold ceramic, you need to be adding on in kind of UK currency, probably 30, 40 pounds a unit to cover your alloy costs. Final type of bridge for anteriors is zirconia. Um, that's quite reasonable for an anterior bridge that you want aesthetic. So you have the zirconia framework, and then on top of the zirconia framework, you put felspathic, and those bridges look beautiful. They look really warm, they're not opaque, they look lovely. Bear in mind that the zirconia with felspathic on, there is a risk of chipping. There is always a risk of chipping. All of the studies on chipping are on posteriors. So when you do any kind of zirconia bridge on front teeth, warn them about the risk of chipping. Let the patient take the risk. Is the chipping getting better? Well, hopefully, yes, because the labs are getting better at bonding the zirconia um, and the feldspathic together. It's still a rubbish bond because zirconia is a crystalline homogeneous structure and you're trying to bond felspathic to this smooth structure so there are bonding um, agents which make that better um, in addition to that 
they're getting better at getting the thickness of the the, of the feldspathic more even and slowly cooling the feldspathic on the zirconia. It is also very lab dependent. Now, people have been asking me about labs. I use a local lab in Sutton Coalfield called AM Ceramics, and AM Ceramics are very good. I've had no chipping with them as a laboratory, but I do know that certain labs um, are having um, chipping, and it's very much how they handle the material. So still be cautious with zirconia for anterior bridges, and it's still pretty much a no-no for posterior bridges. But ask around in your area and see which labs are, are you know, are, are having good results. So ask your local dentist and see who's having good results with it. Um, a non-bleaching um, question: Can you still use um, sodium perborate in the UK? Uh, no, <laughs> basically, as far as I'm aware. Um, so. If it's non-vital bleaching, the main thing to do is obviously take out the excess cavity, take the GP down to gum level, seal over with something like uh, the self-adhesive resin, resin-modified glass ionomer, and then do in-out bleaching. So leave the back of the tooth open, and the patient wears a tray, and they put the tray in, but there's a hole in the back of the tooth, and if they load the tray up, it bleaches from the front and it bleaches from the back. The only thing you have to instruct them on is they have to get a toothbrush and be able to clear basically the rubbish out of the tooth, and they can't bite anything brittle on the tooth in case they break the tooth. And in my experience, certainly, um, you know, I used to seal in high strength um, hydrogen peroxide, oh crikey. Um, 20, 30, even greater percent. But what I am finding now, if I'm doing it with, um, you know, 16% hydrogen peroxide, uh, carbamide peroxide, 7% or 6% hydrogen, then I'm getting pretty good results with it. The patient starts it on a Monday, they put the trays in, and then basically get them back on a Friday and see how it's doing. If it's looking good, seal the excess cavity up. Um, but seal it up with a slightly yellow shade of composite or something so that if you need to drill it back out you can distinguish it from the tooth. So either use a very white shade or a yellow shade. Um, dentine pins, what would you re re recommend for restoration on molars where composites have failed? Um, first question to ask yourself if, if it's if it's basically is it restorable first of all now I don't use pins or posts on molars what I've done um, for well over a decade now is just the Nyar core technique and the Nyar core technique can be used for an amalgam and it can also be used with heated composite as well but you've got to have really good moisture control so to retain, um, to basically retain that restoration, um, use an IR core, either composite or amalgam, or think about something like an endo crown where you're using the access cavity and the very tops of the canal orifices to retain that restoration. Other ways of helping, maybe use the electrosurge to gain more ferrule around the tooth. So look at, look at all of those options Always be a little bit honest. Um, do <laughs> you know? Do you think the tooth is restorable? Uh, because sometimes these teeth are just so lacking in coronal structure, they're not restorable. What's not restorable? Um, anything really with less than about 20% coronal structure is basically very dodgy. Okay, very dodgy. Um, got a question about mill-only zirconia. Um, is it abrasive and is it okay against natural opposing tooth? Zirconia is a strange material because it is, it is basically rock hard and it has more in common zirconia in some respects with, a, with metal than with porcelain. It's basically though not abrasive 
because it is very smooth, very densely packed crystals. So basically what you need to make sure with your zirconia is that the lab have highly polished it. That is more important than glazing it. So make sure that the zirconia is very highly polished and make sure that the lab glaze it as well. The newer zirconias, which are a bit softer, if you need to adjust it, adjust it with an ultra fine diamond with the water on very high and then polish it back up with um, greeny and brownie points with essentially um, the water on very high as well. And then bizarrely enough, studies tend to show that it's actually less abrasive um, than feldspathic porcelain, which has all the little um, filler particles sticking up, which abrade the opposing dentition. Don't forget though, uh, fact of life, all porcelains are gonna be abrasive to the opposing dentition. So you can't win, you know, it is still an abrasive material to some degree. Okay. So in terms of teeth that are mobile, I've got a question on mobile teeth and perio disease. The perio is controlled. Um, what would you recommend for a um, splint? Simplest way of doing this, um, and the lab we use for this is an ortho lab, JJ Thompson. Basically, you get a twist wire splint made. Now the trouble is this twist wire splint that's made by the lab that fits over the back of the teeth is really difficult to position. So what the lab make for you is they make an Essex retainer. The back of the Essex retainer is cut out, but either side here, that holds the basically the splint in. So you etch the backs of the teeth bond the backs of the teeth, put little blobs of flowable composite in, click in the retainer, and that carries the that carries the splint into that area and then bond it. Okay? Uh, that bonds it. And that works very, very well. So get the lab to make a twist wire splint with a little carrier. Um, JJ Thompson can do those if you're in the UK, and that works very well. Um, is there a better tissue compatibility with precious metal and non-precious metal? Uh, basically, no. Um, precious metal, non-precious metal, both are equally biocompatible. Don't forget with non-precious metal, though, there can be, in, in very rare instances, an allergy to one of the non-precious metals. Platinum, palladium, etc. Don't forget, precious metals still have an element of non-precious in them. So you can use precious uh, because it will have a lower incidence of actual allergy potentially, but in terms of biocompatibility of the tissues, so that's okay. Um, next question was, Vital bleaches, how many syringes or tubes do you give to the patient? Um, it depends, really. Now, don't forget with the bleaching, if you're going to use hydrogen peroxide, you'll need less bleach because there is no need with hydrogen peroxide for spacing in the tray, so you'll need less bleach. So realistically, uh, a third of a cartridge should easily do a full arch, and they just put a little blob on the buckle. Now, if you're using carbamide, generally you'd have a spacer, a wax spacer in the front of the tray. The reason being that the carbonide, carbonide peroxide, probably about three times weaker, and it needs to break down to hydrogen. So you would be better off having a reservoir in the tray. So essentially, I would, I would get it spaced, but you would need more bleach maybe about half a cartridge for a full arch. So I hope that helps with that question. Um, on temporary bridges, what technique um, is used to create pontics when a putty index will not help? Um, example, canine to canine, but there's no um, incisors present. 
if you've got that situation, um, you've got two options. Now, yes, sometimes I'll be doing, say, a bridge from, say, a 5 to a 7, replacing a 6. You want to make a temporary bridge. What I'll generally do is you're going to need some kind of index. So you will need a putty index still. So what I would do is, is literally get a denture tooth and some sticky wax and stick the denture tooth into the space and then do a putty index over that and then you have basically your index and you can fill all of that with Luxatemp, Protemp, any of the Bisacryl resins and that will work. Um, if it's a canine to canine bridge, sorry about this, but you're going to have to have had a diagnostic wax up. So you'll have to have a, a wax up that has the one and the two on it, one and the two on it, and then you can have a putty index from the diagnostic waxer. Otherwise, you know, trying to put you know acrylic teeth into here and do a pickup on that just won't work. So you, you would need a diagnostic wax up for that, which you'll obviously need to cost for as well. Um, for a tooth on a page with indications for a gold crown, um, would semi-precious be okay? Absolutely fine. Um, particularly on the NHS, because gold crowns are basically very expensive. So if you're doing a gold crown or semi-precious, the preparation guidelines are exactly the same. The only thing with the semi-precious doesn't look as nice because it looks more metallic and patients tend to prefer the gold. Don't forget for back teeth though, very good option is mill-only zirconia because you can do mill-only zirconia with the same preparations as for gold and then you get something that's a bit opaque but it's tooth coloured. Just be careful with zirconia though, it's more difficult to adjust, it's more difficult to endo through. So there are problems with it. There are problems. Um, next question about impression taking. Someone's saying I use a putty wash, addition cured silicone. Yeah, putty wash is fine. Addition cured silicone is fine. They're saying that they tend to do it as a single stage, but they end up with washing the sulcus. Um, that's fine. So having wash going into the sulcus is a good thing. It means that your impression material is not too hydrophobic. Now, I use, um, generally the material I use um, is Horaeus Calls of Flexitime. I find the wash for that goes really deep into the sulcus and it often pulls out the retraction cord. If the retraction cord comes out clean on your impression, just leave it there for the lab to sort out. If it's half hanging off, then I'll delicately take it off with scissors. But the fact that it's going down into the sulcus, that's actually a good sign because it means that it's flowing well into the sulcus. Um, next question, what are your thoughts on composite inlay onlays versus ceramic? Um, I think composite inlays onlays are absolutely fine. They're not a second-rate treatment for your patient. So if we're dealing with indirect, I up until probably five years ago would mainly go for Gradia inlays and onlays in composite rather than Emacs. These days I'll go for Emacs for my inlays or onlays. The reason being for that is purely aesthetic, is that the in inlays in Emacs uh, and the onlays in Emacs look more aesthetic and the fit is really good on them now. What's the problem with the composite? It doesn't look quite as good as the Emax, and it will tend to stain a little bit more, but it's still very, very good. Don't forget the significant advantage of the composite is it's a lot cheaper. So if you're doing composite inlays and onlays, they're probably a bit less, less aesthetic, but they're, not, they're certainly not a second-rate treatment for the patient. And do you know what? They are probably more gentle in terms of wearing the opposing dentition, but be careful putting them against ceramics. Now, the final thing you can do is a direct composite onlay, um, and this is kind of more of an advanced level of a bioclear, 
but you would almost put like a little donut of flowable around or heated composite and then you can form an onlay over that and the actual bioclear onlays um, work very well as well. Bioclear onlays will take you a while and they will be classified as a large bioclear composite. Could take you up to an hour to do that. So you're going to have to charge appropriately. If we're doing a large bioclear in the composite, the composite in the practice, we'll be charging from about £280. Um, so it's not an insubstantial um, fee. Um, next question, is Fuji Sem the same as GSEM Linkase? Now, I would need to check this, but my initial answer would be no. Be very careful with cements. Now, I recommend GSEM Linkase because it's a self-adhesive resin. So basically, it's a resin cement like a composite, but it has acidic elements to it that etch the tooth and then it bonds to the tooth. So it's much less technique sensitive than dentine bonding. Now we know that GSEM linkase, this is going to sound a little bit patronizing, is a self-adhesive resin because it says self-adhesive resin on the packaging. It's a little bit like um, RelyX2 Unisem, it has self-adhesive resin on the packaging. If it doesn't have self-adhesive resin on the packaging, it probably isn't. Now, the cement you're using is most probably a resin-modified glass ionomer, but if it doesn't have self-adhesive resin, okay, those three words on the packaging, it ain't one. And so it's, it's not as good a cement um, as a self-adhesive resin. So, just be careful with that because the, 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 the companies are really kind of misleading over this. It's not great. Um, oh, in regard to cuspal coverage after RCT tree treatment, when doing it with an overlay, does it have to cover, and it kind of runs out the question there, I'm going to assume that say, does it have to cover the full cusps? Yes. Now, don't forget, if you're doing a molar endo, there are a number of ways of covering the cusps. If the patient suddenly says, and I get this, um, don't have any money. So you've done, you've done the root canal therapy, I've run out of money, and I can't have a crown straight away. Or you're unhappy with the endo, there's been symptoms, or the endo has an had anatomical difficulties, it's fine to just flatten the tooth off by two mils. Then you can cover it with amalgam or you can cover it with composite. It doesn't have to be an indirect restoration because if you get failure, it will more likely than not be the restoration, not the tooth that fails. So it's fine to do it with that. Standard teaching would still be yes, cover all of the cusps um, and I would just go along with that I, I mean there are there is work out there not covering cusps and there is there are people using um, fiber reinforced composite to put in there because it, it gives a little bit of give but I really would just cover the cusps now it sounds destructive but it means your mode of failure is better. It means that the restoration will crack rather than the tooth just goes crack. And the risk is with um, a root fill tooth is you will just have a vertical catastrophic failure. Okay. Um, next question, veneer preparations. Is it wrong to prepare slightly subgingival on the buckle? Um, absolutely not. Don't forget with most veneers, or most preparations, you've got three choices. You're going to go super gingival, often not an option because the colour doesn't match. You go sub gingival, but that can get into the biologic width zone. Or you go what's called equi gingival. Well, equi gingival is about 0.3 sub gingival, so it's still sub gingival, and that's what I'd recommend go about 0.3. Um, how are you going to do that? Unfortunately, you need loops. And preferably a light source. 
And certainly one of the other questions was, well, what loops do I recommend? Um, I, I, you know, I only tend to recommend products if I'm using them on a routine basis. So with loops, um, I have in the past, I've got evident loops, I've got octadent loops as well. Now with loops, octadent do good loops, evident do good loops, um, lemon chase do good loops. There are a number of companies that do good loops. So have a look around and obviously look at the price. Also, it's particularly important you try the loops on. You want them to be um, lightweight, you want them to be comfortable, or you're never going to wear them. Go potentially for times two if it's your initial um, pair of loops, up to I would say you really don't need loops at more than times three and a half. Also as well with the loops, if you see my glasses here, you really want loops that will just sit like a pair of glasses without having to wear the band around the back because the band around the back is, is quite useful to hang them off. But what you don't want is if it comes around the back of your head, particularly if you've got long hair, it kind of just creates a kind of bad mullet haircut around the back and your hair looks rubbish for the rest of the day. Now, in my case, you can see with my hair, that's not an issue, uh, but particularly if you've got long hair, it'll just annoy you and you won't wear them. So you just want them lightweight so they will fit on, your, on here. So you'll have your loops here, you have your light source here, but it's so light that it will just sit comfortably there and you could wear it for hours at a time. I think that's really, um, really important. Okay. Um, oh, and the question was, oh, a bit of a misunderstanding. Um, it was about the wash, the wash ending up in the buccal sulcus or lingually and not around the preps. Generally, you should be okay with this. Use, uh, with a wash, basically what I'm presuming you might be doing is putting your wash into the tr over the putty and then inserting it. The best way to do the wash is on a gun with a very fine tip and then you put it right down into the sulcus and syringe it round over the prep and then the putty goes over that and then when the putty goes in and the putty goes in that will carry it down into the sulcus. I presume that if you're doing that that should work, works 100% of the time for me. Yes if you've got the tray and you've just put the wash on the top of the tray and put it in yeah, you can lose it. It just goes bump down the sides. So basically get it on a little auto mix syringe that you can pump out and just put it around the prep and that should work nicely for you. Um, next question, if RCT has been done through a crown um, and the specialist has placed a temporary for us to give the permanent record, should we re-crown the tooth? Um, a little bit tricky. Now, it will depend on your um, specialist. Now, the one thing I would say about re-endo, um, the endodontic specialist, and I don't do as much endo as I used to, get a bit funny about this. If you've got caries, you need to get the crown off and you need to get the caries out before the re-endo, just to check that the tooth is restorable. Plus, if you've got caries running through, that's microleakage. So you can do the endo, and then you get bacterial leakage under the crown. So get the crown off, get the basically get the um, caries out. If they're endoing through the crown and the crown is intact around the outside, it's more than acceptable just to leave the crown in place. But then what you need to make sure is that in the access cavity, you have, an, you have a proper restoration, not a temporary restoration. You either have a um, dentine bonded composite, resin modified glass ionomer, or, or something like a, a resin bonded um, amalgam restoration so that you don't get micro leakage, that's the important thing. Don't forget coronal seal, one of our really important things, really important. Okay. Um, 
Another question was, um, I'll just take a little question down here first, was um, charging private patients for missed appointments? Um, generally, yes. Um, we do charge private patients for missed appointments. Now, I have a, a kind of relaxed attitude for this. Now, it depends on the length of the appointment. Um, if I've got a large appointment in, say it's in like an implant placement and they cancel and it's two hours, we will generally charge for that. But I am, you know, if I have a relationship with the patient and I know them, you know, sometimes they have very genuine reasons. Uh, you know, cars break down, kids are ill, you know, they're ill, relatives are ill. So, I have a kind of um, relaxed attitude to it in that sense, but yeah, that if it's if it's coming out that it's one of these persistent misses, charge them. Um, you know, we still have one or two in the practice here that I know ones that I've had I've done implants on, we've done endo on, um, we do general work on them, and they'll often miss appointments, and we do charge them because it just mucks up your appointment book, and you have all your overheads to cover. Another little question was about perio treatment on the NHS because of time. There is no easy answer to that, and obviously a lot of dentists leave the NHS because of these concerns over things like perio and lack of time. The main thing is with the perio on the NHS, you give as much time as you can. You get the BPE, which is medico legally essentially, BPE code fours, you do full indices. Then you give the patient as much time as you can to try and get on top of it. That's all you can do. You give them as much time as you can. Then the recall needs to be more frequent. These are high-risk patients, so essentially don't put them on a six-month them on a more free recall. Don't forget with perio. Biggest deciding factor, if you remember from the perio lectures, there was um, a study by Alexan, 30 years, plaque control is the most important factor. So focus on getting the plaque control really excellent. And then over a period of time, you will get round the whole mouth and you will debride all of the pockets. Will the results be as good? Maybe not. Are you performing? You know, are you giving as good a treatment as 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 long a time as private? Probably not, but you are still giving good treatment. And medico legally, you're still covering yourself. So I think that's the best way to try and do it if you can. Okay. Um, next question is: Do you generally prep and then place the retraction cord and the race gel and imp? Yeah, that's generally what I would do. Um, and literally last case before coming up for the, the webinar tonight um, was a bridge prep and quite a big sulcus and yeah I had race gel in there I had double cord for this case as well um, so um, do you input another visit after temps double cord techniques fine you don't always need the double cord so if you put it in and you can see the margin all the way around clearly with your loops, you don't need it. But today, with a patient, yeah, I was struggling into approximately to see the margin, so I put another piece of cord in after that. Um, next question, endo crowns. Um, on the slides, it shows an Emacs crown. Could this be constructed with other materials? Definitely. Non-precious, semi-precious. Um, Emacs is fine, lab composite is fine. Material be a little bit careful with in general would be zirconia because if you've got to try and re-endo through that, you've got no chance with a big thing zirconia on it. Also, as a general consideration with zirconia, don't forget zirconia doesn't etch and it doesn't bond very well. With an endo crown, you are relying quite a lot on adhesion. And so because they don't adhere well, zirconia would be my only kind of contraindication um, in that respect, to be honest with you. Um, next question, is resin bonded amalgam better than simple amalgam? 
are you doing this to replace the composite with amalgam? Um, interesting fact, we're now into December tomorrow. I have not done an amalgam all year. This may be the first year that I've never done an amalgam because I've moved over to the heated composite um, for cores. Is a resin amalgam better? Yes, but the evidence is limited. There's actually a Cochrane kind of review of that, and the evidence for resin bonded amalgams, yes, they do seem to perform better, but the benefits seem to be kind of moderate. They seem to be moderate. Okay. Is it mandatory to prescribe antibiotics for non surgical perio? Good question. Uh, basically, um, no. Okay. Um, when we um, when we do the kind of, I know some of you are coming for the hands-on course um, where we do the five days continuous. Some of these topics we come back to because one of the things we do on the hands-on course um, is we do some perio treatment planning exercises to kind of put it into perspective. Um, and I know those of you who are interested still in the hands-on course, the next session we only have two places left. So if you do want to get one of those last two places, do let us know um, sort of ASAP because the course is definitely going to fill up. Um, with the perio, really antibiotics, you know, it, it's been in the press in the UK again this week about over-prescribing antibiotics. Really, antibiotics are for refractory or non-responsive cases. So you do your non-surgical, but you've still got bleeding. Um, you've still got pockets that are not shrinking. Then you can use the antibiotics, but it mustn't be to compensate the lack of plaque control. So the patient needs to be 80% plaque-free. They need to basically have not responded to the initial therapy as well as you hoped. For systemic antibiotics, probably use, um, if they've got say eight or more pockets, five, six pockets, use systemic, use metronidazole and amoxicillin. If there's problems with that, use doxycycline. Three or four sites, the first line of defense would be the close site, the long-acting um, chlorhexidine gel. The other gel that I recommend on the lecture is, um, and the name escapes me, is the it's the doxycycline gel from Horaeus Culza, and the name has escaped me. Um, but if you check your lectures, that gel, if the close site doesn't work, I've used that gel, and crikey, I've had really good results with that in pocket shrinkage and, and, and reduction in bleeding as well. Um, but if you go back to the lectures, it's the other gel that I recommend as the second um, line. Okay. Um, next question was, what loops would you recommend? Um, well, I've kind of covered that earlier. I think that might have been a question for, from earlier. And there was also, what lab would you recommend, which I've kind of covered earlier, but AM Ceramics would be the lab that I use, who are very good. Loops, look at Evident, look at Optiden, look at Lemon Chase, and also, because I don't want to favor anybody, Oroscopic. They're all very good brands, but shop around because you can get some very good deals on loops at the moment. Very good deals. Um, for an aesthetic resin bonded bridge, what would you use, gold or ceramic? Resin bonded bridge is tricky. Now, um, a gold resin bonded bridge um, often will be fine because of the warmth, you don't get the grayness showing through. But with a gold resin bonded bridge, there's a little bit of flex if they're thin, so they have to be thick enough. If you're going to bond that, you need to use Pamavia, but there is an alloy bond as well that you need to use that comes with the Pamavia, which is deliberately for precious metals. So it's called alloy primer, it's in the kit, and you need to coat your gold with that first of all. Other alternative, um, as we look at in the lectures, is zirconia, but zirconia doesn't bond well. So you need to put the lab put a layer of feldspathic slurry on, and then basically 
with a feldspathic slurry, you can then bond bond with that. But be careful with zirconia. I always warn patients that this is maybe not not the best thing to do. Okay. Um, those who are asking if about the hands-on. Yeah, if you want the link to the hands-on, just comment it um, in the chat box or email us, um, email Alan, and we can let you know about those last two places that are on the on the course, um, which is February, I think. So that's not a long way away. Okay. Um, Periimplantitis. Yeah, tricky question. How often do you take PAs? Will bite wings okay? Is a six-point pocket depth needed? Um, tricky one, periodontitis, because you know I'm seeing a lot more of it. I'm getting referred a lot more of it. Do I see it in my own patients? Definitely, yes. Do not have a lot of periodontitis around. With periodontitis, what I do now is because of the concerns over this. For any patients I restore who are mine or referred, I offer all patients an annual review now, and I would recommend that any implantologist does that. The quicker you can pick it up, the better your response. Bite wings are fine, PAs are fine, as long as you can see the bone level. Periimplantitis is easy to monitor because you have threads. So if you do a parallel x-ray with threads, then it's easy to monitor. And yeah, how often? Six monthly would be fine. And what you should be able to do with your periimplantitis is send it back to the surgeon who did the implants. So I am, I'm seeing periimplantitis on cases I treated five, six, ten years ago, even cases that I did 15 years ago, and I'm more than happy to have those patients back for me to treat the periimplantitis. Now, obviously, if if it's a case that is recent, I will do that under guarantee. And bizarrely enough, I had had a case, um, and I reviewed her today, where she developed periimplantitis literally about six months, got some discharge and um, some bleeding on probing and popping on an implant very, very early. And I retreated that, I took the bridge off, put some close sighting, cleaned it out, and she I reviewed her today, and she'd responded really well to that. And I'll do that under guarantee as a goodwill gesture, but going forward, you do have to charge them to treat the periimplantitis. Okay. Um, what do you think about anamic Vita crowns? Do you know what? I'm uh, At the moment, I'm going to have to sit on the fence. My advice is avoid them. Okay. There are you know, so many other good materials around. If there's a new material out, to be the first person who uses it. Uh, you know, I, I'm going back now, when did I first use Emacs? Over 10 years ago. When I started using it, there were no clinical studies, so I just used it on front teeth. And then when the clinical studies came out, started using it there. But yeah, with this new material, you know, look at the data and you want some clinical studies and you want independent clinical studies. So it's got no significant advantages over anything else. So at the moment, I would say just don't use it. Why take that risk on your patients when you could be faced with quite a lot of failures? Okay. Do you do any observation days in the practice? Do you know what? I must admit, I used to do observation days, and I must admit now I, I don't. There's a number of reasons that, that I'm generally so busy during the day, um, and I've got so many other things going on, that I, it's very useful between patients to be able to get on with those things. So if, patient, if patients are referred in to me, say for crown lengthening or an implant placement, more than happy for the dentist to come and observe what's going on. But also with the observation as well, a lot of my, but not all of my patients are referrals. So they can either be a difficult case or a difficult patient. So I find that, you know, I have to kind of devote my efforts to that. So I tend not to have people in for kind of those kind of sessions anymore, okay. unfortunately. Um, 
Are you stopping Rivero back sand before surgical procedures? I will just need to check the drug for that. So you might want to put that onto the blog um, because what I'll need to do is just check which drug that is exactly because I think that's the tray name rather than the drug itself. Pop that on the uh, blog for me. If it's a oral bisphosphonate, then then basically yes, we would stop that for surgical treatment, preferably three months before. But pop it on the blog, and I'll, I'll get back to that. I can look it up in the uh, BNF and just check that out for you. Okay. Um, flat plane splint. Nice question. My lab does dual lamina. Is this okay? By dual laminate, I'm presuming um, that what you mean is that it's almost like a soft bite guard inside, and then it has a hard top on it. Do you know what? They're absolutely fine. Those types of splints are absolutely fine. Um, I don't use them routinely, but I have made them for patients who've already had that type of splint, and they like them. What's the benefit? Well, because they're kind of spongy inside, they fit, and they, they do retain so you don't get problems with fit and retention. Um, disadvantage is sometimes you have to make the spent a bit bulkier to accommodate them so they can fracture. Or if you make them too thin, yeah, they can fracture. But if your lab do those, try them. If you get on with them, they are no problem at all. Um, is there any other advantages? They may have a shock absorbency effect as well which could be beneficial. So don't forget that will have a slight shock absorbency effect, but I, 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 you know, I don't usually use them because I do so well uh, with just the normal flat plane ones, but there's no problems with them at all, no problems. This is a really good question. What sort of warranty do you give in aesthetic prosthodontic treatment? Standard um, basically would be I give a year warranty. Now, in terms of warranty, I would certainly never look at giving more than perhaps two years or three years, and that warranty has to be dependent on them attending any recalls you give them, and they they also, and this all gets in writing, they also have to. Um, attend with the hygienist treatments as well. Relate your warranty to the level of risk of the patient. So be careful with your high risk patients. Those would be bruxis, parafunctions, day clenchers. Now for some of them, they don't get a guarantee, but I will within a year put things right. So basically with those questions, if you consider them high risk, you have to tell them that they are high risk and that you may not offer a warranty because if they grind or they parafunction or they clench and they've got compromised teeth, they are going to be much more at risk. Yeah. So I think on that question, we're looking at wrapping up now. All, all so, the questions are answered. Oh, yeah. So... If you have any more questions, because I'm sure there's those of you um, with questions, just um, basically, um, if if you go on the blog, and then you can you can basically put the questions on there, and I'll get back to all of those. I am in America next week, so there's a little bit of a delay. Um, it's because my internet's playing up. But generally, if I'm in America and the internet's working, I'll get back to you fairly quickly because I'm probably not sleeping that well. <laughs> and the next hands-on course will be um, in a, We've just sold another one, so there's yeah, only one left. One place. So we've got one February, place on the course. The next is October. So we've got February, but then the next is October because I know a few of you are asking that. And I think the drug in question was a new anticoagulant. Now, I think that was Anka asking that question. What I would do with any anticoagulants, um, write to either the GP or their 
hematologist or consultant or cardiologist. Because with these newer anticoagulants, that's what I do. We have patients on strange and, and, and di different drugs these days. So I always write to the consultant and then basically um, what I would do is get their advice. Also with those patients, you tell them that if they get a bleed, best place to go is, you know, often to A&E. But with those patients of anticoagulants, put a hemocollagenase plug in, stitch it, and then if they, you know, give them very good advice on the packs and stuff, but if they get start bleeding, they are often better off going to casualty. But let them phone you so you can go to casualty as well. And those patients often would need something like a tranexamic mouthwash. So always seek the advice of their um, consultant or their GP. That's always a very good thing to do. So thanks everybody for attending. We're going to wrap up there. Um, but anybody um, who has any questions, just get them online and I'll be getting back to you ASAP with the answers to those. So thank you for everybody for top participating tonight. We had some really good questions as we usually do um, with that. So um, if um, I don't speak to any of you before Christmas, um, have a good Christmas. And then obviously quite a lot of you I'll see in February for the hands-on course. Um, and that will be good fun. But just do remember the hands-on course it's going to be finishing a little bit late every day because I want you to get your money's worth. Mm. So the hands-on course often runs through till about six, half six, because we're doing a lot of practical work. So just be a little bit prepared for that. Okay, so have a good Christmas, everybody, and I'll either speak to you before then or in the new year. Okay, then, so that, that's over and out for me. Okay, thanks. <laughs>